I want to talk to you this morning quickly on the point of no return. In 1519 uh, AD, during the Spanish conquest of Mexico, Hernan Cortes, the Spanish commander, after crossing this sea and spending many countless nights to get to Mexico, on the day he arrived, he dismantled, he burned, and destroyed his ships. He said, so that his men would have to conquer or die. They were not going back. See, they had entered the point of no return. The point of no return is a point beyond which a person must continue on the core, current course of action because turning back is physically impossible, too expensive, or extremely dangerous. The point of no return is a particular irreversible action. Have you ever seen the YouTube video of grandma who has a bottle of Coke and she puts Mentos in the Coke? Anybody? That's the point of no return. There's going to be a reaction to the Mentos. You're wondering, what does he mean? Get a bottle of Coke and some Mentos. Don't do it in the house. But it's a, an explosion. Signing a contract is a point of no return. Do you remember when the first time you bought your house? You're shaking your hand. You know, I got a sign for this. That's the point of no return. And so a plane actually has this place where it, it goes to a point where it's impossible for it to return to the place it left because they have not enough fuel. They have to keep going. And so the point of no return can also be a calculated point during a continuous action. I believe God wants us to be calculated in our life of faith where we decide I'm not returning to where I came from, that I'm actually going forward. GMC, I followed your journey for now almost 10 years, and I was in the old building, and now you're here, and you're in your third service. This is second service, but you're in your third service. Now, it's sometimes physically impossible to do another four or five services. So you have one option, stay here, and in staying, you're really saying, we can't go forward. Or you can have a spirit of faith and say, maybe we need to build again. Oh, amen, Gary, hallelujah. <laughs> to believe God, that God wants to do more. Amen? amen. To say, hey, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not going to live in a place where we're always thinking about going back, but we're gonna go forward. My heart for you today is God wants to, all of us to come to a place where there is no point of return in our spirit, where we say, I am not going back. I am going to decisively make decisions that cause me to go forward, Morden, that God would put in your spirit a resolve to say, I cannot go back. I have decided to go forward where we believe, listen, in what God has said, and we live from that position and place. Listen to this scripture, Daniel, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, listen to the language that David uses. He goes, you enlarged my path under my feet, so my feet did not slip. Whenever God is giving you faith and putting faith into your heart, he's enlarging your path. He wants you to go forward. Now, in the path, there are going to be obstacles. What, listen what he says. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Listen to the language. I love this language. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. Church, can we get a spirit in us that we are willing to pursue, to overcome, to overtake, and destroy the enemies of our life? That we would say, I am never going to let that thing get a hold of me again. I'm moving forward. That's the point of no return. This is not a day for small faith but having large faith in a large God. Come on, do you have large faith? Are you believing for things? Yeah. 
Are you believing for big things? If you're not believing for big things, your God's not large enough. I'm still believing for big things. I just turned 60 this year. I know I don't look that old, but I, I turned 60 and I'm, I'm believing God. I'm saying, God, for the next 15 years, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. These are the people I want to reach. These are the things I've, I know you put on my heart. God, keep putting bigger vision in my heart. I don't want to settle. I don't want to say, let's just return to where it was comfortable. I want to go forward. Come on, do you want to go forward, church? Amen. God, that's the call of God on our lives, to always be going forward. And we're warned. Listen, we're warned in the scripture. Listen to this scripture, Psalm 78. It says this, For he, God, established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. How many grandparents we got here? Grandkids are awesome, are they not? My kids don't matter anymore. It's the grandkids. <laughs> right? Sorry if you're a child of a... If you're the child that produced the grandkid, we thank you for that, but you don't matter anymore. <laughs> Grandkids matter. We, we, we paid our price during the teenage years for you. Now we got the reward, the grandbaby. Right? Listen to what he says. The children who will be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Look at, but keep his commandments. Now the next verse says this. The children of Ephraim, being armed in, and carrying bows, turn back in the day of battle. They did not keep the commandments of God. They refused to walk and obey. In other words, get this picture. We are called to, to live a legacy of life of faith that imparts to the generation, my son, to his son, to his son, that we would put in them faith to believe God, to take bold steps. That's my call. That's your call. Even if you're a teenager, one day you're going to have kids. And your call is to model a life of faith, a life of adventure, a life of determination. But listen, there was a group of people that were armed. They were ready. They were fighting. They were ready to fight the war. They were ready to battle for the souls of men. And what happened? They turned back. Well, it's too hard. Man. I already gave to that. I don't want to give anymore. I've done that before. I don't want to do that again. That's not the call of God on our lives, church. Listen, we're in a battle for the souls of men. We're called to live and declare the mighty acts of God. Hey, has God done something in your life? Amen. Let's tell people. Let's tell people. Let's declare. We serve an awesome God. That's our, that's our calling. We're called to live a life of faith that encounters a God of miracles, that we walk in a God of the supernatural. And when we walk in a God with the God of supernatural, you know what he does? Supernatural things. Yeah. He does great things. He does mighty things. Listen, he heals marriages. He restores life. He brings the prodigals home. He, he touches people. He brings us out of our bondages. That's the God we serve. And we are called to declare that to the next generation. We're called to build that into the next generation. And so we're called to set hope in the next generation. We're called to leave an inheritance for our kids and our grandkids. Can I hear an amen to that? Look, we're, we're called not to go back. We're not going to go back to complacency. We're not going to go back to the good old days. We can't say no to expansion. Church, don't say no to expansion. When the call comes, say, we need to build again. We got that land over there. We're going to build. Say, yes. Amen. Amen. I got some money. We're going to give because we're building for the next generation. Should the Lord tarry 50 years, my church, is ex uh, next weekend is our 50th anniversary. And I've been in, in that church for 27 years. 
So half of its life I've been there. We still have old timers, people who were there right from the beginning. And their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids are in the church. That's what it's all about. But what happens if I decided, no, I'm done. I paid my dues. I'm not going to do any more. What about my grandkid? What if the Lord tears for another 50 years? I want him one day to be the next leaders of the church. Amen? See, we have to have this vision of going forward. Listen to this scripture. Uh, you know, I'm going, I'm, I, I'm, we're going to get right to the message where I want to say. Hebrews 11, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off and were assured of them. Sometimes in faith, you don't always see the promises that God spoke to you because that promise isn't for you. It's for your, your generation, the generations that are going ahead of you, that will come after you. It's some of the things that I, God has spoken spoken to me, I know they're going to be fulfilled in my son. And I'm preparing my son to, to, to do the things that I'm doing. And I'm asking God, Lord, the promises that you've given me, I see where I'm going. I want my kids to experience that. I want my grandkids to experience that. And he says this, um, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Here's number one, point A or point one. The point of no return requires a new way of thinking. Listen, what did, what did he just say? If they had been thinking, they would have had opportunity to re return. If they had been thinking about their old life. In other words, the word thinking there has this idea to be affected by memories. Isn't that true? You think your memories, you start memorying and you, your thinking is going there. It means to be activated by rehearsing. And it has this idea to rehearse to punish oneself. In other words, in our own thinking, how many times have we tended to rehearse of things that we should have done, could have done, that never worked? And what does that do? It always keeps us going back. And that's not the heart of God, church. The heart of God is for us to go forward. And so we have to be willing not to continually over and over and over again punish ourselves and recollecting the memories of the past, but we're to behold a new thing, that God wants to do something new in our life, in our generation. That's the heart of God. And so you're always going to go in the direction of the most dominant thought that you had. What are you thinking about? What goes through your daily thinking? Are you thinking forward? Are you thinking about the future? Are you thinking about what God wants to do through you? Or are you thinking about all the things you could have done? All the things you should have done? See, your thinking can affect your ability to make right and wrong decisions. Your thinking can affect your ability to let go and let God. Your thinking can affect your ability to go forward or they could have stayed. Like the Bible says, they could have stayed. They could have said, hey, we're comfortable here. Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to add that? Why do we need to do this? Well, I'm, I'm really comfortable. It was nice. The food is good and life is good. No, no, no. God has something better. Church, God has something better. See, God's calling you to think big. Would you say think big? Just turn to someone and say, God's calling you to think big. Wives, be kind to your husbands, okay? Just, but come on, let's look, dream big. Be bold in your thoughts. Change the way, listen, change the way we think about God. Change the way we think about church. Change the way we think about money. Change the way we think about our time. Change the way we think about our future. Uh, you know, Pastor Claude made this comment, right? He said, our number one reason is to worship God. How about we think about how we worship God? 
Am I worshiping God? Or am I just doing it how I used to do it? Or am I open to something new in the spirit? Romans 12 verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. The way you think. Letter B, the point of no return looks past the easy and the convenient uh, opportunity and longs for something better and something more. If they had been thinking, they were longing. Now, the, the longing, just the definition of longing, it means to stretch out. Like this girl's got a drink on the front, you know, I'm going to stretch out and grab it. You know, when I, I'm, I'm often away for long periods of time for my grandson. And literally, I, I, we always say to him, one more sleep, two more sleeps, you know. And then when he's there, like, I, I'm ready. I'm, I'm like, come here. Come here. Give Papa hugs, you know. Why? Because I'm longing to see him. That's the heart of a, a person of faith, is I'm longing for more. I'm longing for God to do greater things. I don't want to be complacent. You see, you and I were never created to be ruled by the secure, the easy, and the safe or convenient life. We were never to become so comfortable in life. We're to live by faith. God has always prepared things for you and I to walk in. And the only way we're going to uh, acknowledge that or uh, receive that is you got to have faith. The main reason we're here, hear me, is to worship God, to plunder hell, and to make Jesus appealing to humanity that they would turn from their sin. We're called to plunder hell. We're called to worship God. Have you ever had a situation in your life where you got to this position where you felt completely out of control? Anybody? And, and you knew it was God leading you? Do you remember in the, in the um, I think it's Matthew, let's not think, Matthew 14, Jesus says to the disciples, experienced fishermen, hey, Get in the boat and go to the other side. They're halfway through that, and all of a sudden the seas are tossed, and there's this incredible storm. They're freaking out. They're, they're we're going to die. Experienced fishermen. We're going to die. And then Jesus comes walking on the water. And they look, and they think he's a ghost. Once they realize it's Jesus, right, only one said, hey, if it's you, Call me to come. And we get a lot of, if he gets a lot of flack, Peter gets a lot of flack because he took his eyes off Jesus and he, he fell. But he was the only one that was willing to get out of his comfort of his boat and step on water and nobody else had stepped on water and he walked on water. He did something supernatural. Amen. Hey, let's get out of our boat Hallelujah. of comfort. Let God stir you to do something new in your faith. See, the point of no return is the opportunity for God to show up. When you say, I'm not going back, and you take a step of faith, God comes, and God shows up, and God does something with your life that you never would have thought that he would do. Here's the last one. The point of no return receives the approval and the reward of God. Listen to what it says. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. When you obediently move out of your place of comfort and step into the will of God, God is not ashamed of you. He actually puts his favor on you. God puts his approval on you. So let's take a step. Now, how do you do that? Well, maybe you're new here. Get involved in a ministry. Just volunteer your time. 
say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out and get into, maybe get into a small group and begin to open your heart, your home. Get in, involved in a conversation with your neighbor or coworker and begin to share your faith. If you're gifted, if you have gifts, utilize it. Respond to the Holy Spirit in your life. Sow your finances into the church so that you can reach more people. Build better facilities so you can grow and, and reach the harvest. Decide, I will not return to the way things are. Decide, I will be intentional in moving out of my comfort zones. Decide, I will live in faith. Decide, I will not go back. In Brazil, um, we, were, uh, we were in an Uber, and I was with a pastor, um, another couple uh, friends of ours from on Ontario, and the wife speaks Portuguese. She's American, but she speaks Portuguese. I don't. I speak Holy Spirit. That's it. You know? <laughs> So we have these Uber rides, and you have a certain amount of time to, to, to where you get, so like, you know, 15 minutes. So she immediately engages the guy, starts talking, sharing Christ with him. And I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to her, and I want in. But I don't speak Portuguese. But I do speak Holy Spirit. So I said, Holy Spirit, tell me. And so I, I, Chris kind of finishes with the guy, and I said, hey, ask this guy if he's got a son who plays an instrument and a daughter who's creative and in the arts. And so she asked him, he goes, he looks at me, he goes, yes. And so I said, tell him this about what I believe God's telling me about his son and daughter. And like, he's crying as he's driving the Uber. Right? And we pray for him, and then we get out of the Uber. We get into another Uber at another day, and Chris, you know, she starts engaging this guy, and she turns to me and goes, Gary, he's a believer. Well, again, I'm, I'm praying. I'm just stirring my faith. I'm getting out of my comfort zone. And I, I heard the Lord say, this man is struggling to have children, and today is the day of his miracle. And so I said, ask him if he's struggling to have, ask him first if he's married. I'll make sure, yeah. I'll make sure of all that, right? Number two, I said, ask him if he's struggling to have children, and he he looked and he goes, "Yes, I'm the problem." And I, I shared our testimony of how God did a miracle, and he pulled over the car like in, like he's missing a fare now, right? He's just using our fare. So he pulled over the car. We laid hands on him. We began to prophesy that God is a God of miracles. He's weeping. He's saying, "Yes, Amen. Praise God." They've been trying for mul multiple years. I said, "Listen, I know God. I know what God's saying. You're going to have a miracle. Go home and tell your wife tonight. We're going to have a miracle. God's moving." Listen. You got to step out of your comfort zone. You got to say in your spirit, a point of no return. A point of no return. Let me read you one last story, okay? About 150 years ago, there was a great revival in Wales. As a result of this, many missionaries came to the northeast of India to spread the gospel. The region known as Assam or Assam was comprised of hundreds of tribes who were primitive and aggressive headhunters. Into these hostile and, and aggressive communities came a group of missionaries from the American Baptist Mission, spreading the message of love, peace, and hope in Jesus Christ. Naturally, they were not welcomed. One, min, one missionary succeeded in converting a man, his wife, and two sons. This man's faith proved contagious, and many villagers began to accept Christ and Christianity. Ang uh, the, uh, the angry, uh, angry, the village chief summoned all the villagers. He then called the family who had first converted to renounce their faith in public, uh, uh, to renounce their faith in public or face execution. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. Immediately, the enraged chief, he ordered the archers to air arrows to down his children. As the both boys lay twitching on the floor, the chief asked, will you deny your faith? You have lost both your children. Will you lose your wife too? But the man replied, Though no one joins me, still I will follow. 
Immediately, the chief was beside himself with fury. He ordered his wife to be arrowed down, and in a moment, she joined her two children in death. Now he asked for the last time, I will give you one more opportunity to deny your faith and live. In the face of death, the man said the final memorable lines, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. He was shot dead like the rest of his family, but their deaths, but with their deaths, a miracle took place. The chief who ordered the killings was moved by the faith of man. He, or, he wondered, why should this man, his wife and two children, die for a man who lived in a faraway land on another continent some 2,000 years ago? There must be some remarkable power behind the family's faith, and I too want to taste that faith. In a spontaneous confession of faith, he declared, I too belong to Jesus. When the crowd heard this from the mouth of their chief, the whole village accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. A missionary took these words and he wrote the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. 